Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I hope you all found the vanishing trial as compelling and as convincing as I did. Um, and that you also had an opportunity to learn about the problem with the right to trial and how it's disappearing. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Debbie Gatte, the Philanthropy Roundtable's Vice President of Strategy and Innovation, and I'm really looking forward to diving into some of these issues that we just heard about and talking about what we can do about it. Um, but first, why would the Roundtable host this conversation? Um, our tagline is strengthening our free society, and we support donors who are interested in advancing liberty, opportunity, and personal responsibility. So we definitely have an interest in making sure our rights under the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution to a speedy trial are being protected. And if violations of that right are resulting in many consequences that affect someone's liberty or their set of opportunities or their ability to take personal responsibility, these are issues that we hope to help support philanthropists in their efforts to improve the system. And while we also think it's important for us to share the stories of people who experience those consequences in real life, um, and to understand how important our individual rights are and to be willing to engage in some of the hard conversations about what's causing these issues. And for that reason, um, I have a colleague with me here. Um, but before I introduce our panelists, I wanna call on Brandon Millett, who's our new Vice President of Marketing and Communications. Um, Brandon has an amazing career that took him among other places into the filmmaking side of telling pro-liberty stories. And we are super lucky to have Brandon on our team. And so before we dive into the panel, uh, Brandon, can you share with us as a filmmaker and as someone who is super passionate about the Roundtable's mission, what were your impressions of the film and how important is it for us to tell these stories and tell them well? Sure, yeah, well, you, you hit upon it. I mean, I had a rather unique introduction to the entertainment industry because I really, before I started producing films, I got into it by launching a film festival with my wife to uh, change the way that military veterans are being portrayed in film and television projects. And um, we chose to do that. We chose that medium of film because there's no more powerful uh, vehicle for social impact than, than film and television. Um, and one of the things I learned, by the way, from doing hundreds of, of events is that the people who have just watched a great film really want, or they're eager to connect with the stars of the film. That's the people who made the film and the people who were in the film and shared their stories. So I'm gonna be really brief here, but I feel like The Vanishing Trial is an exceptional example of storytelling. Uh, it's also an exceptional example of how we persuade, how to most effectively persuade. Um, you know, human beings think in stories, not facts. So every decision that we make really is based upon a story that we tell ourselves or a story that somebody else has told us that we, for one reason or another, bought. Um, and so when it comes to sharing stories, again, there's no more powerful way to do it than putting it up on screen. And the reason that it's so impactful is because films, films impact people on both an emotional and an intellectual level. Um, there have been studies that have documented how effective films are at changing hearts and minds, but I've seen it happen time and time again, changing hearts and minds, but also changing, changing lives. And this film's gonna do both. It's gonna change lives, and it's gonna change hearts and minds. Um, from a, just putting on my film critic hat for a second, um, the production value of the film was pristine, uh, the editing was exceptional. The, the performances were amazing. And I think I've mentioned this to, to, uh, to Kevin from FAM that when a director makes a decision to use recreations in a film, it can make the film or it can ruin the film. And in this particular case, it really made the film and it added emotional impact and appeal. And uh, I found it compelling. I found it educational and uh, two thumbs up from my perspective. So congratulations Great. to FAM. And, right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks for helping to set that context because film is, a, is an important, powerful vehicle. And we don't often pause to talk about the vehicle. So thanks for joining us and uh, okay. providing that perspective. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So Brandon's gonna to go off camera now and I'm sure you're all excited to hear from our panelists. Um, so I'm gonna ask all of them to turn their cameras on. And um, we are going to have a real start a real conversation here. Um, I'm honored to introduce what I think is a courageous group of people who are willing to come today and have a, a very real conversation about issues that might be difficult to talk about. Um, and they were all willing to do that. So thank you very much for joining us. 
Um, one quick note, I do want to disclose that I am on the board of directors of FAM, which is one of the two organizations that made the film, and I just think it's important to make sure I disclose that to everyone. Um, and now, who do we have here? You may recognize Kevin. Um, Kevin Ring was towards the tail end of the film that you just watched. His story was told there, and he is the president of FAM. And this is a bipartisan criminal justice advocacy organization founded in 1991. Prior to that, as you learned in the film, um, he worked on Capitol Hill and for then Senator John Ashcroft. And uh, he was on the Republican Study Committee, was a federal lobbyist. He's the editor of two books um, on the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. Um, and as I said, you just heard his story um, in the film. We were also joined by Norman Brown, our credible messenger. And Norm is a program manager for the District of Columbia's Department of Youth and Rehabilitation Services. In that position, Norman oversees the city's Credible Messenger Initiative, which relies on formerly incarcerated in individuals to help steer at-risk youth from crime and violence. Norm served 24.5 years of a life sentence in federal prison and he was granted clemency in 2015. And we're gonna hear more about that, but yeah, 24.5 years. And next we have Danielle. Hi, Danielle, welcome. For, welcome. Uh, Danielle is the founder of For the Lives of Prison Wives, LLC, which is dedicated to providing support to those women who are supporting their incarcerated significant others. She's also the author of Prayers of a Prison Wife, 30 Prayers to Pray for Your Incarcerated Husband, she received her undergraduate degree from Alabama State University and her master's degree in counseling and psychology from the University of West Alabama. Thank you for joining us, Danielle. And we have Holly Harris with us today. Hi, Holly. Um, Holly is the executive director of the Justice Action Network, a bipartisan criminal justice reform organization. In that role, Holly really has raised the national dialogue on the need to fix our broken justice system developing high profile events with governors, members of Congress, and state legislators on both sides of the aisle. She previously held various positions in Kentucky government and politics, including general counsel to the Republican Party of Kentucky. So thank you all for joining us today and, and um, looking forward to this very much. What we're gonna do is have a little bit of one-on-one -on -one conversation um, with each of you and then bring everybody back on so that we can have a group discussion and, and answer questions that are coming from the audience. Speaking of those questions, there is a Q&A box at the bottom and feel free to put those questions in at any, at any time and we'll be watching that. And if it's not answered naturally during the course of the program, we'll definitely um, take a look at that. If we don't get to it in the hour, we'll be sure to follow up. Okay, so Holly, Norm and Danielle, we're gonna get you to turn your cameras off and I'm going to have a chance to talk with Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so what was it like to tell your personal story in the documentary? Um, well, I've told my story a number of times because I, I think it's helpful for the work I do. Um, but this was the first time that I, we did a recreation at my house. So that might have been a little bit more than I expected emotionally to sort of relive that. And you saw, at least in pieces, my daughters were in the film. Um, you know, one was too young to remember it. One remembers it very well for being young. And so it was, you know, I mean, I, I was happy to do it. We weren't going to put me in the film, but there was an aspect of the trial penalty that we didn't think was covered, or at least our director didn't, which was, the pressure that gets put on somebody. So our other defendants, two of them are in prison, and Sandra was in the midst of a drug addiction and doesn't really remember the decision making. Whereas for me, it was a news tightening. And so they wanted to sort of capture that aspect of the pressure the government puts on you. And also to show that this affects people, drug crimes, gun crimes, and white collar crimes. And so my offense was different in that regard. So I, I said I would do it, but I, like I said, it was, you know, having the agents recreate the raid that morning um, was a little unnerving, but it was no more, you know, it was a traumatic event. And so that's natural, I suppose. Hmm. Well, I'm glad you told the story in the documentary and it, it does supplement some of the angles that you talked about. So uh, thank you for sharing that. And so what's the reaction being to the vanishing trial? 
Well, it pretty much depends on your audience. So, you know, we work a lot with the families of people who have loved ones in prison. And for them, it is almost uh, liberating um, and affirming. I mean, they see it and every single person says, that was exactly my experience. And um, they went through some version of that. Um, and then there's people who don't know this issue as well and they're shocked that this could happen. And it's similar to what, you know, I worked on Capitol Hill, had a lot of law and order friends who sat through my two trials and watched what happened. And they couldn't believe it was happening because their instinct and bias was that this does, this kind of injustice doesn't happen. And they were shocked. And so they, even I had people who believe in the system wholeheartedly saying, I know you didn't do this, but just plead guilty to make this go away. And I thought, what's wrong with our system that that's, that's, that that's your reaction. And, um, so it really depends on who the audience is. And, you know, I think there's just things that some of us who work in this area take for granted, the fact that trials have disappeared and people don't know these basic facts and then why that happens. And so, like I said, for families, it's been affirming of their experience. And I, and I just, I should also mention that, you know, Sandra and um, Chris who are in the film, you know, they, there's no doubt about their guilt and they admitted as much. And I think Eric and myself to a certain extent recognized wrongdoing, but maybe fought our charges. But the question isn't guilt or innocence. It was like, what happened to that process? Was this a, a quest for truth and proportional punishment or did it become a game of let's make a deal? And I think, you know, I, I think the film shows that. Thanks. Um, and you yourself were, were someone who really believed in the system when this happened, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so now uh, I'd love to hear what you think the connections are between these right to trial issues and other aspects of the criminal justice system, because yeah. they're, they're all intertwined, but how do you see those connections? Well, I think I, I mentioned at the end of the film, I believe I say something about this is a symptom of other problems in the system. And we didn't want to bite off more than we could chew in one sort of film that people would sit through. And so we wanted to identify the problem and just have people say, okay, there's an issue here. I do care about liberty. I do care about constitutional values of our system. And I care about fairness and families. And, and so this seems wrong. And we didn't want to get into what all the solutions to that would be, but it is connected to the things um, that have gone wrong in the way we administer justice in this country. And that to me is largely about getting away from our constitutional system of separation of, of powers. So, you know, it used to be thought that the legislature defines what crimes are and sets maybe a range of punishments. And then the executive and the prosecutor in the form of a prosecutor brings charges against somebody. And then you have the judge, judiciary with the jury's help, you know, decides if somebody's guilty or innocent and then sets the punishment. And we've just moved away from that. I mean, I think in the quest for efficiency, and then when crime was high in, in the quest of sort of toughness, we moved to a system with very few checks and balances. And so now you have lawmakers who have never laid eyes on a defendant setting penalties through the form of mandatory minimum sentences, which are one size fits all automatic sentences um, that cover a whole host of crimes that they don't even, can't even imagine. And then you have prosecutors now who, with that tool, are able to coerce people into pleading guilty. Um, and they have little oversight over how they act. So they decide who to charge. They decide what charges to bring. There's really no accountability or oversight. We let the executive do that. And so at the end, judges and juries become administrators. Um, and so juries, which in our founding era were a check on government authority, now become sort of almost bureaucratic, like, oh, here are my jury instructions, was the law broken, I'm out, that's all I had to decide. And then a judge who the jury just, you know, trusted implicitly to sort of decide what the punishment was, that should this person be banished from society, now just has to read what the penalty was set by the legislature maybe 30 years ago. And so, you know, I think separation of powers is not just some abstract concept. It's like, we all do better when people review our work product. And, and so in this case, you know, having the executive sort of pursue these crimes, the legislature look at ranges of punishments, have judges look at facts and make these decisions, that was a better product. And what we've got now is something that's built for efficiency, but not for justice. Thanks, Kevin, that's, a, that's very helpful. 
Um, so now you now lead an organization that's dedicated to helping families affected by the system find ways to improve it and advocate for themselves um, while protecting individual rights and public safety. Uh, so how unique do you think FAM is among the group of criminal justice organizations because of that combination of things? I know a lot of organizations think about racial justice and social justice, and, and that has a different sound to it. So how unique do you think FAM is in its approach? Well, let me just say, I mean, I may be a good example of this in my evolution because I was drawn to this once I was being charged and, and investigated. I joined FAM 12 years ago before I was charged. It was this sort of abstract constitutional issue to me. It was philosophical. It was the feeling that if the prosecutors decide you're the bad person and they can, you know, there's no getting out of that. And at that point, your last hope is an independent magistrate at the end of this process. And if the judge doesn't have discretion, though, because of mandatory minimums or something else, you're dead. And, and the reason I didn't serve 20 years in prison is because my judge had discretion. So it was philosophical to me. But when I started working at FAM, I met, you know, thousands of family members who were going through it and suffering much worse consequences than I did. I had a lot of advantages. I had an education. I had some means to start paying an attorney, although you can't really fight the government. Um, and so, you know, I had all these ventures and meeting these people who, you know, are getting picked up or getting charged with crimes and they have really no recourse. They have, they have no way to fight the system. And I think one thing that, you know, FAM, so FAM sort of sits at the intersection of policy and people. I mean, we don't tell these stories because I, I know narrative, the power of narrative, but these aren't anecdotes. These are illustrative of systemic problems. And so we tell those stories because if I just said to you, 3% of trials today end in, uh, you know, 3% of cases go to trial and 97% are resolved by plea, you may not understand why. You have to see the pressure and how the system works. And so that's why we tell stories. But, you know, they're illustrative of these systemic problems. And, you know, by working with the families, I've realized how undervalued that voice is in this. So, you know, we, we understand public safety in terms of, you know, keeping people locked up and so that the public is, the communities are kept safe. But what does it do to families when people are over punished, right? And so you think about the FDA, when the FDA makes a decision, it, could, it can approve a drug too quickly and people will be harmed by that. But it could wait too long in approving a drug and people will be harmed by that. And so the key is to getting it right. And so I think in our criminal justice system, we have deferred to, we can lock people up and throw them away forever. There's no downside to that, that we can err on one side. Instead of trying to get it right, we can just do that. And working at FAM, I just saw the incredible misery and uh, waste that went in this system of just throwing people away. I mean, Norm's gonna tell his story, but you know, to send somebody like Norm Brown away for life um, is a disgrace. And it's a shame on all of us that we are you know, party to a system that does that. Um, but I will say the other thing that FAM is clear about is we're not the Innocence Project. Every people, everybody that we represent, Danielle will talk about her husband, they're guilty, right? And so the point is not that people shouldn't be held accountable for what they did. Public safety is still a driving goal. It's just a question of, are we striking the right balance? Are we doing things that are making us safer or that give us a sense that we feel good out of something of vengeance? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask you one last question, um, and it's a it's a tough it's a sensitive one, but I'm going to ask it because I think it's it's an important one. Um, I don't think I think it's pretty obvious you're a white man, <laughs> and um, have has FAM experienced any pushback for being a white led organization? Um, what are some of the, the kinds of um, experiences you've had on that front? And how do you think about, how do you think about that whole issue of race? It's a big question, but the, one, the yeah. part I want you to focus, I'd like to hear about is, there's a lot of, there are some funders who are questioning whether white led organizations should do this work. Right. Have you yeah. had that question asked? Yeah, I, this is somewhat of a new phenomenon. I mean, the issue of, heading an organization that works on this, um, you know, that people will always maybe question that because they view this as a civil rights issue or that it's primarily hits black Americans. And as a percentage of population, that's true. Overall, our prison population is about 40% black, 40% white, 20% Hispanic. So if we didn't have any black people in prison today, we'd still have one of the highest incarceration rates in the world. 
So it is an American problem, but it certainly hits communities of color harder. And so I get the, the, the feeling that, you know, that that's something maybe the community should lead. And I think in the wake of uh, George Floyd's death, that there's more a sense that, you know, everyone in the culture is sort of saying, what can I do to be part of the solution? And there's groups that fund criminal justice reform saying, well, my contribution to racial equity is going to only be to fund groups that are black led or, or that, you know, racial justice is, is their only focus. And, you know, that impulse is there. It's not everybody, but I hear it. And, you know, we're impacted by that. And, um, you know, there's not, not much I can do, you know, about that. I, I can't change that, except, um, you know, our goal is the families that we represent are black, white, brown, anything, and we don't care. And they are all in pain. And in many cases, they've all suffered some injustice, although, you know, they all will recognize the need to be held accountable. And so we just try to focus on results and not that, but in this climate, you know, because race is, those issues are so prevalent in the system, it's come up now in funding uh, in a way that it hadn't been before. But there's not much I can do to address that except to say that, you know, our focus, if to the extent that Black Americans are being hurt most by the system, then our reforms are going to benefit them the most. And we're conscious of that. But I, I can't change, you know, my tone. <laughs> well, thank you, Kevin, sure. um, for sharing that story. I'm going to We'll have you back in a moment. Um, I'm sure there are tons of things people want to know, but I'm going to have you um, go off camera now and have Norman uh, join us. Thank you. Hi, Norm. Hi. Hello. So you've had some personal experience with the trial penalty. Yes. What happened in your case? And in, in <clears throat> hindsight, would you have done anything differently yourself? Wow. Um, no. I don't think that I would have done anything different. Uh, as I looked at the film and I saw the young brother that was, uh, that was sentenced to a life sentence at the age of 22 years old, um, it was my first time seeing the film and it got me somewhat emotional because I was 22 years old uh, when I went to trial. And I was in a conspiracy just like he was. And as Kevin often said, this is not the innocent project. So I definitely uh, were involved in the selling of narcotics. But when I was uh, going, uh, and when I got incarcerated or got locked up, the first offer that came to me was a 22 year uh, offer. And I was 22 years old and it was with cooperation. And at a, as 22 years of age into something that you really don't understand or what you're into, because we don't enter into certain behaviors, uh, understanding all the ramifications of the laws, understanding the laws. That's one of the last things that we tend to pay attention to when we are playing these death games with our, our communities and our lives. So when that, that offer was offered to me, I was like, it's no way in the world. Did you say 22 years? I can't accept 22 years with cooperation. I'm 22 years old. So I started doing the math and it didn't add up because I didn't think that whatever I was involved with, uh, being there was no death was involved and different things like that, that it was no way in the world I could see myself coming out of prison at 44 years old at that time. And then um, what happened? So what I ended up doing was uh, constantly being pressured into uh, accepting that, taking that plea. So it was 35 of us that were incarcerated on this case. Uh, we had three different trials. So we, did, we, we decided and I decided to go to trial. Um, and what ends up happening off times, a lot of times, it was also in the film where our, our attorneys oftentimes are court appointed because we can't afford attorneys. And oftentimes what you fail to, what we begin to realize is that a lot of these court appointed attorneys are in over their heads with caseloads. So they come in uh, not with a thought in mind of taking us to trial because that causes preparation. So what they come in, 
uh, saying to me is, look, I think that your chances for winning in trial is not going to be good. They have this, they have that, they have this, they have that. So I think that you should take this plea. And I was like, no, nah, I can't take that plea. So what I ended up doing was firing that attorney and my parents had put up uh, their property for me to get a lawyer to start with. And so we eventually ended up going to trial. So I went to trial. Um, I beat all of the majority of the two conspiracies, the 848, which is a kingpin charge. I beat that and I was found guilty on strictly distribution. But at the end of the day, I still ended up uh, with a life sentence. Well, thank you for sharing that story with us, Norm. Um, thank you, Devin. It's like, what have the personal consequences been to you as a result of the 24 and a half years in prison? Uh, well, for me, the consequences have been, and I looked at this, uh, at this film and I saw where the, uh, the young man came up before the judge. And you can see in that four year time span how much he had grown and how much he had recognized that he wasn't the same person that he was when he was committing the crimes that he was committing to the time he was before the judge. So as I looked at my life and coming from a background where my mother was a school teacher, my father was a, a hard working man with two jobs and I was caught up in the peer pressures of, of things that we do at that age. But when I eventually went in and began to find myself and educate myself and then begin to educate others, as uh, I began to formulate classes for the BOP and all of these wonderful things and saw my growth, I decided, I said, well, um, the benefits from all of this was my growth and my development and all the things that I had to offer as you will see many people like myself that will continually sit in prison and a lot of people that be lost their mind from these sentences. One minute you see them up strong, the next minute you will see them in peel lines or committing suicide from some of the draconian sentences. So the upside to mine is that I came out uh, with some of my right mind because I say some of my right mind, Debbie, because you can't be in unnatural environments with those kind of harsh sentences over your head and not be affected to certain degrees in some way. And now that I've been out for five years and the work that I do, I constantly still are shedding some of the skin of being incarcerated for so long and certain things you don't see that were damaging to you until you're confronted with them. So I'm constantly always noticing those things in myself and constantly trying to uproot them as I begin to live my life as a free man. Well, congratulations, Norm, on Thanks. everything you've done and accomplished in the five years that you've, you've had to do that. That's amazing. Thank you, um, Debbie. So I want to ask you um, another tough question. And uh, this is about, it's kind of the same similar question that I asked Kevin about race. Okay. Um, and what, what role do you think race plays? Is it race? Is it class? Is it both? Um, now that you're thinking about everything, you heard some what Kevin said. Is there anything you want to share with us on, on that front? Yes. Um, and, I, and I echo some of Kevin's, the uh, majority of all of what Kevin said uh, when it comes down to race and class. Um, because oftentimes when you see the way the criminal justice system has affected people of color, it, uh, Kevin gave up some, uh, some, some very balancing numbers and, uh, and what he was saying. And when it comes down to the amount of people and, 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 the, and the demographics of race that are incarcerated. But when you sit around and you look at, uh, while I was in prison and sitting in there with all of this time, and I would also look around and see why it seemed like at that, at that epidemic or pandemic of crack, it seems like everybody that was in prison was either someone of color. But when you also look in there, and I had conversations and I met a lot of great people uh, while I was in prison, you would see and have conversation with those that were white males that had 
quadruple the amount of drugs that uh that people of color may have had but didn't receive the same kind of time that we received so race definitely plays a role in the uh, criminal justice system but then you would also see the class because you would also see those that were white that were there that came from a lower class uh of the white community and they would be in there from the drug use uh aspect of it and they would have certain sentences that would be more time than those that were white who had a large amount of drugs so yes class plays a major role in uh in the criminal justice system and the climate now is is a beautiful climate and you asked kevin a a, a question about the funding aspect and i believe that the funding aspect shouldn't be narrowed all the way down to uh to race because you have organizations like fam that i've been a part of and my family has been since 1991 and they have a proven record of uh of the work that they do and we also have a lot inside the communities that i work in every day that are not being funded that are black and are doing a lot of their work from a voluntary standpoint which doesn't go very far so they do need to be funded but at the same time uh organizations like fam who's deeply rooted in what they do if we're going to fund organizations that are black led and they do need to be funded that they can learn from organizations like fam and how this goes and how it should go so to fund those proven organizations and along with those who need to be funded uh coming out of the black community i am pro all of that but just to make sure that we can strike a balance thank you norman i thank appreciate you, you telling telling us your story and sharing that with us um, I wish we could talk longer, but I'm going to bring Danielle on because we have her story to tell too. So I'll okay. get you to turn your camera off and, and bring Danielle on. And hey, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Danielle. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So you know what it's like to have a loved one in prison. Right. And um, you had to raise a family during this long period. What would you say most people don't know about what that's like? Well, um, I think a lot of people don't know the hardships that actually um, come along with raising families. Um, financial hardships. We face a financial hardship, of course, because now you're down to one income. Um, we also had to deal with our children not being able to be with their father. Um, you have the traveling that you have to worry about that's an expense. You have commissary, you have uh, to pay for phone calls, all these things and so so much more. You know, um, you have your loved ones, they're gone so long, it's a possibility that they will get ill in prison. And you can't be there to deal with the sickness and the way that the prison is um, operated. They get 15 minute phone calls or if there's not money on the books, you're constantly worried. So you're in a constant state of, um, stress even subconsciously i think how long was your husband in prison daniel um, he was in prison for 14 and a half years and you have two two kids yes we have two children together yeah i had the pleasure of meeting one of them yesterday for yes sweet. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some of the consequences you, you described some of the consequences to your family during that prison time but what have been some of the consequences of the whole episode uh, consequences of the whole episode, I would say, even even now, um, the consequence is we have to build relationships again. Um, I did not know what to expect when my husband was coming home. You know, we we're all excited but nervous at the same time because he had been gone so long. How did, like Norm say, how did it impact him while he was in there? You know, um, he had to establish time. The time miss you can't get back. So he had to learn my daughter and learn my son. And that's still going on now because he's just been here a year. Thankfully, he was able to be here for my daughter's uh, senior year and to drop her off at college. And um, my son's now in the 10th grade. But um, those are some of the consequences, just getting transitioning back into society, period. Um, looking for a job, 
um, he, technology and everything was totally new. You know, he went through the halfway house, but he was not, they weren't trained properly on how to transition. What do you do? How do you apply for a job? How do you fill out an application? He was ready to go in and talk to somebody, but I'm like, it's not like that. Now you apply online. <laughs> so it's uh, a lot of different um, consequences that come along the way. Yeah. Now, we actually didn't talk about this. But, um, you mentioned when you saw the film that it brought back some memories for mm -hmm. you. Anything about your experience with the whole trial process that you would like to share? Yes, and particularly, I think uh, that second story was Eric's, um, if I'm not mistaken, or, or was it Chris, I think. Um, yes, I can recall my husband calling us from, at the time, he was in county jail. And that was the most stressful time because we were trying to help him decide. And it still was ultimately his decision if he wanted to go to trial. Yes, um, he accepted responsibility and was willing to accept the plea. And he felt he was told that he would get no more than 13 years if he accepted the plea. So um, that's what he, he did. He accepted that plea and still was sentenced to uh 22 and a half years so just that time of decision making we like norm said you may do the crime and you have no idea what you're facing um as his wife and and family and my parents were involved in the decision making his parent uh, father was alive then and we all would just sit down after we got off the phone and just talk to each other what do you think he should do because he did feel like he should go to trial about some of the charges but um, ultimately he did not, and he still ended up with a 22 and a half years sentence. Wow. So you must have had that, that feeling that you haven't mentioned. And we got some noise. I'm thinking if someone's got their mic on, and if they're off camera, maybe you could turn the mic off. That would be great. Um, so yeah, Kevin mentioned some families find that hard to watch. So I'm imagining that was- Yes, that, 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 <laughs> that was. It brought everything back. So um, I, I want to ask you as someone who's benefited from organizations like FAM in this hard time that you went through and all the support that you needed. When you hear that some funders are questioning whether groups that are white led and FAM's not the only one, there are there are many others. When you hear that some of those supports are being questioned because they're led by white people, how do you feel about that? How do you react to that personally? Well um the time that we're living in with Black Lives Matter, and I am a Black Lives Matter advocate, um, when my husband was incarcerated, what he told me was, um, I need you to go to this website, look up FAM, because I'm receiving emails from them, and he was really connecting with them. So just tell me a little bit more about the organization. And when I went to FAM's website, I was immediately drawn to the stories. I never thought about who led the organization. I never even asked him. He never told me. Um, what I saw was the stories that I could relate to. And it was like so many, and th these stories were diverse, you know, story from diverse people. And um, I immediately connected with the stories and I reached out to Pham um, because we were trying to get help on uh, with his case. And the first person that I talked to was so genuine and um, they told me what I needed to do um, we ended up, and the thing about them, they form relationships with these families. You know, the same way they know me, they know every other family that they deal with. And I think that they're genuine and, um, you know, their heart is in it because you have people that have gone through the system and know the obstacles themselves that work for a fam. So for me, it was about the work that was being done. That's, that's all the families want, who's doing the work, and this is who we ran across that's doing the work. Thanks, Danielle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're gonna bring Holly on now and then we're gonna have everyone come back for questions. So I'll have you turn off your camera and here's Holly. Hi, Holly. Hi. Hi. So you have not experienced a trial penalty, unlike our other Thank God. Yes, you have not had this experience personally or, or been involved in someone's case. Um, but how serious is this issue and how, what, what do you think people who are on the center right need to know about when it comes to getting involved in an issue like this? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm like a lot of people out there. Um, I feel, I always felt like, you know, people pled guilty 
to a crime, then they were probably guilty. Um, and that's why, um, you know, the movie, the, the trial penalty um, had such an impact on me. We haven't done a lot of work um, in the Sixth Amendment space. And, you know, watching, um, you know, what Kevin had to go through, because he's my friend, and, you know, watching, um, you know, what the government did uh, to his family, to his children. And I hope I'm not talking out of turn here, Kevin, but, you know, I mean, uh, they threatened to shoot his dog. <laughs> And, um, you know, I'm a conservative because I believe in limited government and I, um, you know, I, I want to curb government overreach. I believe it has a negative impact on individual liberty and, and economic prosperity. So, um, you know, I'm going to quote Mitch McDear in the movie, The Firm, you know, it's scary what the government can do to anybody. And so as a conservative, I mean, I feel like this is the issue we should be most concerned about because it is really a perversion of the law when a prosecutor can take, you know, sentencing guidelines or, you know, persistent felony offender laws and coerce individuals into pleading guilty so they can spare their children and their families pain. Um, that is, uh, I mean, we should be offended by that as conservatives. Um, and, you know, of course, as my mother always says, you know, if you're not going to be a part of the solution, you really can't complain about the problem. So I'm hopeful that um, a lot of the center-right organizations that are watching this will get involved um, and will care very deeply about this issue because um, I, I think it's a really important one that's been ignored for far too long. Right. So even you who worked in this space, the, the sort of the Sixth Amendment part of it was not something that you thought much about. I'm just thinking about Brandon's comments around this, the storytelling power of something like, like the movie. Um, I'm not so. really, you know, I wasn't immersed in sort of, you know, the criminal justice world when I came to this work. Yeah. I mean, I think that's part of the reason I was brought in is I sort of had um, a clean slate, no pun intended, where I could sort of, you know, look at something and say, that doesn't make sense to me, or that's not really resonating with me. Um, I didn't understand a lot of the alphabet soup of criminal justice reform, but I'll tell you, um, you know, what did speak to me was the stories, you know, that were, were told, um, you know, through FAM and particularly, you know, through this film. Um, you know, it's really impacted me and now I've, I've got Kevin, you know, roped into working in Kentucky next year. Right. So. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, so what happens, do you think, if people on the center right don't get involved in these issues? So there's a case for why they should, right? But what happens if they don't? Well, I mean, I think if you advocate your role and you leave this to, I mean, you know, look, the, the far left organizations, the very progressive organizations, um, you know, are, are certainly going to be working in this space. And I was just looking at a poll the other day about how the vast majority of, of voters are um, uh, really offended um, by the defund the police movement. Well, folks, that's where we're headed. If we don't get engaged on sustainable solutions that are public safety driven, um, and they can certainly also be driven by our conservative principles. I mean, I think everything about criminal justice reform speaks to conservatives. Um, but, you know, if you abdicate your role, then don't be upset about what you face, um, you know, when you're not a part of the solution. What was your mom's quote, a quote again? Because it was perfect. Mm -hmm. She said, if you're not going to be a part of the solution, you can't complain about the problem. All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that mostly, you know, uh, applied to some stuff in high school, but, you know, it still resonates with me to this day. That sounds like a whole other webinar, Holly, <laughs> we should do. Um, so Justice, Justice Ashton Network, you lead that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I raised that question with Kevin because I have heard this from some funders that they are, they are questioning whether they should lead, um, they should support white-led organizations. And this is not a topic that we talk about every day, but we're talking about it here. I want to get your perspective as a white woman who is leading an organization and wanting to be part of the, the solutions. You know, look, I've had a lot of insecurity about this. I'll be really honest. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, our, our team wanted to do something on, on Juneteenth, you know, and ce you know, celebrating the abolition of slavery. And, um, you know, I kept saying, I'm not the right voice to be talking about this. And, um, you know, and it's funny when you, when you mentioned this yesterday, you know, I called several, several of my black friends and I, I wanted their perspective and they said, no, 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 you don't get to sit on the sidelines. You know, we need to be unified in this. Um, and, you know, you look quite frankly, Holly, like oh, these lawmakers, you look like, you know, their wives and their daughters. And so 
we need your voice, you know, to be, you know, impacting a lot of these lawmakers, you know, who really have had no entanglement with the justice system. Because, you know, if, if you have had experience with the justice system, you know, but the vast majority of lawmakers haven't. And so, you know, what they were saying is, you know, your voice is just as important. We need to be unified in this. And, and, and look, I'm not saying we don't need to be elevating a, a diversity of voices. We absolutely should be. But, you know, to say that, um, you know, like a, someone like a Kevin Ring shouldn't be leading an organization. I mean, I can't even imagine what the criminal justice space would be like if we were deprived of Kevin, um, you know, because it's not so much who leads the or organization as it is how they lead the organization. And just like, you know, Daniel said, you go to the fan website, it's not all about Kevin. I mean, Kevin's got a compelling story, but he really makes it about the families. Our organization happens to be about lifting up lawmakers, you know? And so I, I think you've got to have a diversity of voices, but I really think it's a, it is a tragic thing to say that someone should be excluded from this work. Quite frankly, it's antithetical to everything we stand for. Well, thanks for answering. Oh, I'm actually going to ask everyone to come. <laughs> Thanks for sharing it. I'm going to ask everyone to come back um, on camera so we can talk some more and answer some questions. Okay, so um, I guess my first question is, how did that feel for all of you? <laughs> um, because we talked about some some sensitive things. Um, was that a difficult experience for you? And we can start with anyone. Um, I'll start with Kevin because his mic's off. Oh, I, I you know, I was just going to say that uh, I, I came at this issue with different biases from my work experience and the way I grew up and, and then being exposed to the system. And the one thing I would say is I think a lot of times with race, we're talking past each other in a way that's not helpful. So you have people who are clinging to certain beliefs. They don't want to they don't want to, they want to believe the system's doing the right thing. And so they don't want to impugn it by saying, oh, you know, this is racist or that's racist. And I just think after any exposure to the system up close, you will see the inequities. And, and when you see them, you can't get away from it. And if you debate intentions, like if the government, you know, withholds too much from my taxes, I don't care what the bureaucrats intention was. You know, it's, it's just a harm to me. And I think with the justice system, sometimes people get hung up with, you know, when I look at the f debate in the federal, you know, the Black Caucus voted for the, you know, crack disparity. It, it, it doesn't matter. It's how long after we realized that it didn't make any sense that it take us to fix it. You know, so I just think sometimes the debate is the two sides are afraid to concede that race is a factor because they're afraid they're going to concede that it's, you know, that it's everything and it's not everything. But I just think we have to have more honest conversations about this. Well, thanks, Kevin. And, and Norm, I know that you, you are a believer in honest conversations. Um, what do you think about what Kevin just said? The need for honest conversation. I think it's, um, no, that, that's, that, that's absolutely um, the truth um, because in doing this kind of work, I'm working with Kevin and, and, other, and other people. And we constantly, before we were under the COVID crisis and we were in meetings and oftentimes you will find that this conversations can bring silence to a room. And in order for it to bring a silence in a room, you hear people say it's the elephant in the room, the oxygen gets low and everything. But the whole reality is that it's real and you have real live people before you who have suffered from it. So in order for us to be able to move past it, you have to deal with it. And we have to get some thick skin. We have to speak some truth to the matter. And if we're gonna really be the America that we say we wanted to be, then we have to talk about it. Like in families, when there are some issues, let's bring them to the table, let's discuss them and let's move out on them. If not, then we're not being truth. Hey, Debbie, I want, to tell you, I want to tell you one anecdote because sure. I, I thought yeah. it was so illuminating, which is, you know, uh, Danielle is amazing what she's done with her kids, uh, raising them. And, um, you know, she was talking about with the families, she didn't look to see who led fam or anything like that. That, that wasn't important. And when we, you know, after the President Trump signed the First Step Act, 
And we brought a bunch of families to DC because we thought they better go thank the lawmakers because we always criticize them, but we never thank them for doing the right thing. So we had, you know, like a hundred lawmakers, Holly was part of this, and we brought them to DC to go thank everybody. And then we thought we were gonna go to the White House. And I had people on my staff, our staff is a mix of conservatives and progressives. And the progressives were like, I don't wanna go to the White House. And every family, affected family, black, white, brown were like, I want to go. I'll thank the president. They don't care who helps them get free and get brings justice. They just want justice. And so it's funny if you see the polling from within prisons and stuff, I don't want to make this political. I'm saying it's not political. That people just want to know you care and that you hear them and that you're in the fight and fighting the good fight. And so I think people should just tone down the politics around this and just do the right thing. And, and it'll work itself out. But I, it's amazing to me that th these folks who, if you listen to you know, talking heads on TV would have said, oh, they wouldn't want to go to the White House. They didn't see Donald Trump in that way. They saw him as the person who signed the First Step Act. That was it. Yep. And, th and that's what they care about. <laughs> yep, that's true. <laughs> Very true. Actually, I was, there, I was there that night and saw the, saw the excitement yeah. that the families had. So Holly and Danielle, I'm going to give you a chance to weigh in on this. And then um, I, there, is a, there is a question for, for Norm that I want to make sure we get to. But um, anything you want to add to what Kevin and, and Norm just said? Yes. Um, I just want to add that um, I agree um, that race is the elephant that's in the room, the elephant in the room. And once what George Floyd's death did, it brought light and people were actually able to see what took place and that's what started or ignited the conversations. And I think this film, The Vanishing Trial, is the same type of uh, film, where it's the film that can ignite conversation because now people can see what's taking place in the justice system. It's not often that you see the stories, you don't see what goes on you know, uh, with the law and how the law impacts the family and how the judge's hands are tied and they can't use their discretion. But with the vanishing trial, you're able to see that. And I think that's what can ignite and open minds to be more receptive of the race issue in the justice system. Oh, look, we're talking about it here. We've got this group talking about it. So Holly, anything to add? Thanks, Danielle. Mm -hmm. No, the only thing I'll say, getting back to the film, um, you know, I love the film because it does show, you know, a diversity of people of different backgrounds. I didn't know how powerful Kevin was, like on the hill, um, but um, it showed a diversity of individuals, you know, who had really suffered at the hands of, you know, overzealous government, and um, uh, I feel like you're exacerbating stereotypes if you're only lifting up the stories of you know, black and brown people because white people commit crime too. And um, you know, I, I just think it's important that we're all working together um, you know, toward these solutions. Um, you know, look, I'm an hour and a half from Louisville right now and you know, we're scared to death that Louisville is gonna burn to the ground here pretty soon because there's such a lack of trust um, you know, between law enforcement and the, the communities that they serve. And, you know, I'm just hopeful that, um, you know, not only are we involving black, brown, white voices, but we're, you know, we're also involving law enforcement voices. Just as we involve impacted people, let's also talk to law enforcement. Because for years, and I, I think we've done a real disservice to um, the criminal justice reform work, because we've been talking past law enforcement and not, not to law enforcement. And, you know, the more I sit down and talk to prosecutors and, you know, police officers, you know, the more I realize how much we really truly do have in common and how much we agree on. So I'm hopeful that we'll continue to grow the tent. You know, this is a game of addition, not subtraction. Ah, yes, thank you. Okay, so Norm, there's a question for you specifically. Um, and the question is, do you think your growth and development while incarcerated makes you the exception or are you the rule? And so of wow. the panelists, you are um, the person who had the longest experience um, in prison. So are you an exception or the rule? Well, um, that's a great question because I don't wanna put myself in a category where I become an exception. Um, but the exceptional, part about prison nowadays 
uh, that is different from previous years when it wasn't overcrowded was that prison was set up to possibly have an intent to reform you. But due to the overwhelming amount of overcrowdedness, the lack of money, uh, all of these things now, prison has become a warehouse where it takes an, over, an overwhelming amount of family support uh, to continue to show you love, to come visit you, to continue to humanize you so that you can and be willing to take on the, um, the challenges of, of staying sane, of, of developing and becoming a better person. It takes a determination to be able to do these things. So those are the exceptional aspects uh, that I would say you would need. The rule is that a lot of people don't have that. So when you moved from the District of Columbia and you're all the way out in California where you won't get visits, where you won't do this, you won't do that, and you're sleeping on top in a room with three and four and five people, the tension is high, then the rule is that you have to survive. So in that process there, people don't often find the beauty in themselves because they're too busy trying to survive. So the exceptional part is that when you have all of the things that you need to stay whole and human, those, that's what can make you exceptional. Not me as an individual, but my support team, if I was able to answer your question. Yeah. So people like Danielle for her husband and all the people Ooh. that she mentioned, you all got on the phone and, and it, you know, this it's support system around the system. Um, yeah. That's exceptional. Right. That's the exception. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, Kevin. What is the what happens next with this film? So if, if people want to share this film, because look at the conversation the five of us just had. Um, and as Danielle said, you know, maybe this will spark some real conversations about problems in the system and people will see it in a different way. What is happening with the film? When when can people share it? When can other people see it? <laughs> yeah. Well, so we've been doing screenings like this one, but you know, some some more public ones. And we're about to do a week-long screening next week. Uh, just for a lot of people who have signed up but who haven't had a chance to see it. We just signed with an educational distributor who's going to get it to colleges and law schools and the rest. And then not too long from now, we should be putting it on Amazon Prime so that then it'll become available generally for people. But we have, you know, we have a lot of screenings lined up. I mean, Harvard Law, you know, wants it. We have lawmakers in addition to one Holly mentioned, there's some others who want to show it to their colleagues. So the demand has been great. And I think, you know, some of the it allows people to talk about some of these sticky issues in a way that's very human. And, and so it's, it's a good front door for people who haven't thought about these issues a lot. So I think that's, that's what the demand has been. And so, like I said, it should be public soon. I mean, we're tired of <laughs> doing these one by one screenings, but it, it's coming. Excellent. Well, um, it certainly sparked a great conversation amongst us today. And I uh, am really grateful to all of you for taking the time to do this panel and to be open to having a conversation that we don't normally have. Um, and I think it, it's good that we had that conversation and I had a great group to have it with. All right. Thank you all. And um, hope everyone has a good day. Thanks again. Bye. <laughs> Bye.